The word sacrifice keeps on popping up in our Eucharistic praying. And some of you have uh, let me know that you find those words difficult. And I want to say, for very good reason. Let me discuss with you a little bit about what is meant and what is not meant by the word sacrifice, so as to see if I can allow you to find yourselves into a more comfortable way of praying Eucharistically. There's a perfectly simple sense of the word sacrifice, which is not what is being meant here. And that is the way in which, for instance, I, a priest, offer a sacrifice to some divinity who presumably needs it for whatever reason. Or that someone demands of me a sacrifice for someone else. Uh, like some of the people are saying, well, all these old folk, we really ought to allow them to die for the sake of the economy. That's a sacrificial model of priesthood. That is specifically and exactly not what is being asked for here. If that's what you think you're doing when you say the word sacrifice, then please don't say these prayers. <laughs> that's the wrong thing to be doing. I'm going to use the example which my mentor, my guru, René Girard, always used when explaining the double meaning, perhaps, uh, the two possible sets of meanings behind the word sacrifice. He always used the story of King Solomon's judgment of the two prostitutes. You remember the story, two prostitutes, both of them had daughters at the same time, they both lived together, during the night, uh, the daughters of one of their uh, of one of them died, so the mum quickly swapped babies with the other one, and the other uh, woman, when she woke up, found her baby dead, but it wasn't her baby. So they took the matter to the king for judgment, and the king said, "Bring me a sword." I will now cut in half the baby so that you can each have half. Whereupon one of the two women said, that's splendid, quite right, then we're both in the same position. And the other one said, no, I would let, let the other woman have the baby. I would prefer that the baby live than that I win. Of these two, you could use the word sacrifice perfectly easily. One woman was prepared to sacrifice the baby in order to be equal with the other woman. And one woman was prepared to sacrifice her right to the baby in order to allow the child to live. We use the word sacrifice for both but they're obviously completely incommensurable in meaning. They're not the same thing at all. One is involving killing something, and the other involves letting go of something, giving something away for the sake of life. Now, it's only conceivably in this second meaning that we can possibly refer to Jesus' going up to death as a sacrifice. I should say that it was language with which he was familiar and he was perfectly happy to use, so we shouldn't be too shy of it. But he was too happy, he was happy to use it precisely because he was bringing it to its fulfillment and actually exploding it from within. Because rather than this being the account of us sacrificing someone to God or in some particularly terrible notions God demanding that we sacrifice someone to God, as though God needed uh, bloodlust satisfying or something like that. It's exactly the reverse. God gave himself up to us. We are the angry divinity, if you like, in the picture. And God is giving himself up into our midst, into the midst of us violent and sinful humans. Precisely so that we can be utterly amazed 
by the generosity, by the power, by the forgiveness in that act. And so we realize we never need to perform any kind of sacrificial logic ever again. That self-giving up into the midst of us, so as to enable us to live free from the world of sacrifice. That's what's called the one true sacrifice. And please notice that means that all other sacrifices are not true sacrifices. They're almost rands, they're fakes, they're nine dollar bills, if you like. <laughs> they're either not the real thing at all or they're a cover up. But the self giving of God up to us, sinful humans, so that we may be amazed forgiven, loved, reached at our most violent and unable to understand how much we are being let off. That's the sense, if you like, of the word sacrifice, the same sense as the good mother in Solomon's, uh, in the, the wisdom of Solomon. The good mother was opening up the possibility for the baby to live. Well, Jesus is opening up the possibility for us to live. Now, okay, you might say, well, that's just what Jesus was doing. What about what we're doing? Well, our way of sharing in what Jesus was doing is by giving thanks. That's what a Eucharist is. We start to give thanks and we find ourselves able to share inside that self-giving. Someone who is giving himself to us and enabling us to turn into givers of ourselves away to others. Which is why I use the word sacrifice very happily when I pray. I'm thinking not of anything that I'm doing. I'm thinking of what is being done for me and with what joy I am going to be turned into someone capable of doing that for others. A final consideration. Good people can't share in Jesus' sacrifice. Only bad people can. That's one of the really weird things about all this. If you're a good person, you're probably shocked by the word sacrifice. If you're a bad person, you understand how sacrificial you usually are, how full of rift and cheating and treason and injustice and gossip and all those awful things which are the day to days of our lives. In other words, you understand that you are a fully fledged sacrificer in your day to day life. And then into your midst comes someone who using that language, that mechanism which you know only too well, turns it on its head, lets you free from all your involvement in all that stuff and says, now let me take you somewhere else and make you a player of a different game. That's why I think it's uh, so important we remember that uh, to be able to pray on the inside of our Lord's sacrifice is something which only sinners can do. So I want you to remember that this is there is something quite 